Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Painted in Color podcast. I'm co-host Lauren Brown and joined by Mia Araujo, co-host as well. Uh, and we're here to talk about networking as an introvert. Introverts uh, are very common in the art world. Uh, me and you included me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it can often really be really difficult to follow different rules about how to network, how to get yourself out there when you're a person who doesn't feed off of the energy of being around other people, but you feed off of the energy of being alone. And so how do we take our energies that, uh, you know, is so calm and inward and turn it outward to network and gain a community of artists together? Because that's very, very important in this field. So uh, Mia, what has been your experience networking as an introvert? Sorry, my camera dropped. <laughs> I don't know, it's good. <laughs> It has been an evolution because I, I think as I've said on the show before, I used to be way more shy and I, and I still get moments, you know, where I get like, you know, camera shy or get anxiety or if I have to present or pitch or anything like that, my heart just will not stop. Like it's going to a hundred miles an hour. So that's like, you know, that's still there. But I think uh, again, as I've said many times on the show, because I had for so many years to work as a server, to work as a retail, you know, work in retail and stuff. Um, it really got my fear down um, a lot about just talking to strangers. And, um, mm. but I'll take you back to the very beginning when I was like right out of school and going to gallery shows and stuff. Um, I was really, really nervous. I was, I was like such an, uh, like a, oh gosh, what am I trying to say here? I was, I got, I get tongue tied like I am right now. Like I, I and then I would just be like, oh no, and it all go downhill. Like it's like once I had that one slip, it's like everyone knows. And I, and I was always like so hyper aware of like, everyone must be paying attention to how much I'm messing up right now. And, and, the, and the truth is like, I've, after I realized after so many years, it's like, they're not, mm -hmm. no one cares how you're doing, how you're performing, what you're thinking, how you look like you are the one who cares so much about all that. And you're so worried about every little thing. And I have high anxiety too. So, I mean, when I go to gallery shows, I would hate driving. I would hate looking for parking mm. spots. You know, I'd hate being a woman out at night alone, you know, and being a tiny woman <laughs> as well. Um, and so by the time I got to a gallery show, I was already so like full of anxiety that it was just such a, a nerve wracking experience. So yeah. what I would do though, is I would kind of set myself up for success. So if I made it to a show, that was a success. And if I talked to one person, then I could go home. And then as I got more used to it, I would kind of like up the bar a little bit. So it's always good to push yourself and, and like push yourself out of your comfort zone. And that's how I eventually got here. But I think early on, especially when you, if you have a lot of anxiety about being around people, I would just try to keep it really easy to succeed each time you do it so that you could feel like I want to do this again, or I can do this again. So anyway, that's just kind of how I took it. Yeah, it sounds like setting your own versions of milestones, basically, of like, you know, it doesn't have to be the biggest thing ever. Like, oh, like my goal is to do like a big presentation. Like that's too big of a jump from coming from nothing. Yeah. But I like that you started to set smaller, um, you know, like ideals for yourself. Like, I just want to talk to one person because like once you've talked to that one person and you've accomplished that goal and then next time you can go with a, you know, slightly larger goal. Of, like I will, I will talk to two people or five people and then slowly but surely you get more comfortable with you know being able to speak to somebody or like you know to be able to put yourself out there um yeah, yeah that definitely resonates with me too because I also you know grew up as a very like a shyer child I wasn't really good at talking to other people just in general because I I just didn't know what people were into and I was so in art that I I just wanted to talk about art or anime or cartoons or video games and if I couldn't relate to somebody on like one of those levels I just like didn't know what to say and I would just get really scared and really anxious. And so I would often avoid having like one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. And, um, you know, like I would just be really afraid that I would be boring to them or I would, you know, scare them away by saying something weird. Um, but I started to get a little bit better around, about that when I started to find like-minded people, like, because like, then I realized I'm like, oh, like there's people I can talk to about all these things and they don't think I'm weird. <laughs> and like some of them are weirder than me, which is great. And um, I started to slowly get more comfortable uh, with myself and with, you know, with other people. But um, still like, I, I mean, sometimes I still get nervous when talking to just like somebody I really don't know just because I'm like, I hope I don't come off weird or say the wrong thing. Um, but it took me a while to, to really start to get out of my shell and to really show uh, my authentic self. I think that, um, 
what I would often do was I would try to compensate for the fact that like, I just didn't know how to, you know, behave around people by um, kind of like being more of a chameleon and like just blending into, you know, like whatever kind of vibe, uh, you know, it was, if it was like at a party or get together, um, you know, like I would just like absorb as much of the energy as I could and then project that energy out rather than really being authentic. Um, and so like, it took me a while to like, to unlearn that and then be like, oh, people actually like me for me. Maybe I should just show who I am and maybe they'll be okay with it. We'll see. But um, but that, that really didn't start happening until I think uh, like college and grad school really um, is when I started to really feel more comfortable. Um, and then I started to do panels uh, at conventions and things like that. And that's when I really started to come out of my shell. <laughs> but that, uh, you know, that started probably about five years ago, I think. Oh. So it's still a journey. <laughs> still I cannot tell. It was only five years ago. That's amazing. Yeah, it's weird to think about because I feel like I've been doing it longer too, but I do it at multiple conventions. And like the reason how, like how I got into it was because my friend was like, hey, like there's a panel, there's an opening for a panel at DragonCon. You want to go? And I'm like, I've never done a panel before. And she was like, oh, there's a, there's a panel about background art. You, like, you've done background art for five years. I'm like, you know what? I have done background art for five years. I'm like, maybe it won't be so bad if I do a panel talking about something I already know about. Maybe that'll be okay. And it turned out really, really well. Um, it was actually like an 8 a.m. panel. Like it, it, everybody on the panel was really sleepy and like hadn't like gotten their brains together yet. And I was just like on the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> like, the conversation so I was like I know what I'm talking about because I've already done this and like you start to gain a lot more confidence when you already know you wait when you have a place to speak from um it, you start to gain a lot more just like energy behind it because you're like oh like I'm not like faking it this time I can actually back up what I'm saying right now it feels a lot better that way yeah definitely when uh when you when you went to your first con though how was that like I'm curious um you know as to like how you spoke to other people or like did you approach artists at first or did you just kind of like skirt by the lines and like look at them and be like I don't know what to do <laughs> how was it for you which what was your first con I think it was I think it was either San Diego Comic Con or Wonder Con which is like the smaller version of San Diego um yeah. in Anaheim and it was uh I went to my first oh you know what I lie actually my first convention was CTN and I know that's not a typical um like convention but that was before I met my boyfriend and I was even more shy back then. I mm -hmm. think was, I'm trying to think if it was like 2010 or something like that. It was like ages ago. And I was, I was definitely like, I went by myself, you know, I was just like, I, like I did what you said, I blended into the crowd and I would just, I was just excited to be there because there were so many of my heroes there. And so I was just like, just trying to get into all the panels I could and watch all the demos I could, but I didn't really talk to attendees or anything like that. Um, yeah. but I think I did know a few people like, uh, Marshall Vandruff, he's an amazing teacher and he's one, was one of my mentors. I'd actually taken a few workshops with him. Um, and actually that's something about networking that even taking classes, taking workshops, going to life drawing, that's actually networking in a way, especially if you're in a community kind of like, you know, Southern California and stuff like that, where we have a lot of those things and a lot of the same people go to all of those. Um, because he had seen my face a few times, it was just like, oh, you, and I just like, you know, gravitated towards him because I knew him and started asking the questions. And then he's like, here's Peter DeSev and here's Terrell Whitlatch. And I was oh, like, wow. what the heck? You know, so you never <laughs> know, like those, those events are such great places to just like, you know, one person, you know, might know other people introduce you to them. And, and it just kind of is a ripple effect. And oh, yeah. it, it was such a magical experience that it's like, now when I go to shows, I usually know so many more people than I did back then. And it's such a great time. And I actually hang out at the bar afterwards and you know have drinks or just hang out or have conversations, have dinner. But back then I was just like going home after you know the floor closed, but I still had some valuable, you know, interchanges with people just because I knew one person, you know. Yeah. And again, that's where that sort of training from gallery shows kind of came from, where it's like I, I saw that it's like once I knew one person and then I'd go to a show the next weekend, that same person was there and I could start by talking to them and kind of warm myself up and then talk to some other stranger, you know, and then it's just um, over time, it's just kind of like you build your network like that, I guess, just by being from a familiar face. When you're an outsider, it feels like there's an impenetrable wall to get through, you know, because yeah. nobody knows you and there isn't. And that's the thing. Unfortunately, the way the world works is that people like to work with people they know, people they feel like yeah. they trust, people that they like. And it might seem like favoritism or like that's unfair, but in a way it's just, that's just what feels safe, I guess, on some level. 
Um, and everyone's nervous, even the pros, you know, they're nervous. And so they'll gravitate towards people they know and, and familiar faces too, you know, and stuff. And so it just, it takes a while to break in, but once you do, you kind of, it, it becomes easier. It's almost like the ball just keeps getting momentum, if, it, if you will, you know, um, in yeah. terms of being recognized and stuff like that, just, just by showing up, you know? And that's super valuable because this world is extremely small. It is so small. Yeah. Like, it seems like, I mean, there's a lot of artists out there, but really like you'll see the same people crop up at the same shows, at the same events, at the same workshops. Like there's at, like usually at least one person who's like around one of those things that you'll end up running into. And to have that one person who recognizes you and knows that you're cool. And there's, so, there's somebody who could like vouch for you or say like, hey, like I know you. Mm -hmm. Like that's a really amazing start because like then slowly you see all these strangers around you and you start to make those connections. They're not strangers anymore, but it can be scary too to approach somebody when you don't feel confident or you don't feel like you belong there. Um, you know, because like you think that you're not worthy of approaching them or something like that. Yeah. But really, yeah, like you said, like the pros are also nervous. Like everybody is a little bit nervous because everybody's their their own center of universe. Like, you know, like you, like you were in your earlier life, you thought that people were looking at you and judging you for different things that no one's even going to notice. Mm -hmm. And that's because like we are our own main characters and we have ourselves under like the scrutiny so much because like we're writing our own little novel about ourselves in our heads but nobody else is like reading that novel all they see is the cover and however you represent that cover is up to you but you know the way people perceive you if you project a little bit of that confidence then sometimes that's all people need to be like oh like what are you all about like they they might want to know about you and so you know it's it, it can be really scary but if you like have that comforting thought that everybody is also a little bit scared and when you talk to people you usually realize like oh like these amazing people are actually worried about being imposters too yeah. then like it becomes a little bit easier to to talk to them because they're all more human in that way totally and actually let me just say one quick thing uh because that i just remembered that for years when i was going to these conventions or even just going to gallery shows where it was other people's work i would not show my work i would not even say that i'm an artist and it, it was an exercise of just like this is not about me this is about the other person. And I think for me, that is still something I hold to this day that when I network, they are kind of just more about, it's more about a relationship for me. And I only approach people that I'm actually really interested in getting to know. I'm not trying to get something out of them. Yeah. I, I care about their work. And, and so I think if you're nervous about like how to meet people and stuff, it's almost like, you're, again, you're, you're making it about yourself on some level. Like how will they receive my work? What if they don't like it? Don't even make it about your work. Like just like get used to just talking to people by talking about their work. Cause people love talking about themselves too, oh, yes. you know? Yes, so do. just, that's what I would do. I would go up to my favorite artists and be like, look through their books and stuff. And when there was a break in the conversation or something, I would just not gush or anything, but just, I would kind of like hold back maybe 20% of how I really felt. <laughs> 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 and just be like, you know, just like point out one specific thing that I loved about their art. Like, I just love how you draw figures. Like they have so much life or something. People love hearing that about their art, even the pros, you know? Yeah. And that would just kind of get a conversation going. And then if they were curious and they would ask, oh, what do you do? Then that's an opening for you to show your work. But I was not going there as an intention to show my work or get work or any of that. It was just about getting to know that other person and, and really centering them in that interaction. So, yeah, yeah, def yeah definitely. I think it honestly, I, I've been going to conventions since 2003. Otacom was my first one. But I think it took me seven years before I even like approached artists to actually talk to them, like just talk to them like people um, about their own art. And I couldn't believe that I had waited so long in order to open up that conversation because I hadn't started tabling until um, I think 2011. Oh. So it was just a year before I started tabling where I just like actually started to open a dialogue with some artists and be like, actually, like, how did you get in here? Like, I'm just curious. And then I was like to talk to them about their art. And, you know, like, get, like they definitely love to gush about their own work because like, you know, that's what they're there to show. Um, and then sometimes the conversation, you know, would shift to like, hey, like, are you an artist too? Like, because the way I would talk about their art would uh, allude to the fact that I probably knew a little bit about art. And um, and I'll be like, oh, like, yeah, like, you know. And, and they're like, oh, like, let me see your work. And like, you know, you'd show them like your business card or whatever, and, right. and that's when they were just like, why aren't you tabling here? And it's just like, you know, and then you're like, oh, like, wow, I didn't think that I was even like worthy of doing something, but you never know when you have a surprise like that. Um, another really good example of just like that, that small key networking though, or like just accidents as well, um ctn was also a really really magical convention for me mia um i went first in 2011 what year did you go 
I went that? every year until uh, probably 2018, but I, I'm trying to think that the first year that I went was either 20, 2009 or 2010, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, I mean, CTM was awesome because like the environment that's set up is set up in a way that at least went back when I went, um, it was set up in a way that you could just walk around and like legends would just be passing you in the hallway yeah. and you're just been looking like that was, that was like Andrea Stasia. Like what, like what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> no, like the person who made part of my childhood is just right over there that's wild yeah, yeah. yeah and it's just like they're just in the crowd like very casually and um you know oftentimes when I'd walk around CTN I would just like see them on the convention floor just holding court you know just like in the in the middle of the common area and like just all these little students like surrounding them um and I would you know just like join and sit and just like listen to what they had to say but you know, like if you also just like have a conversation with them, just a normal conversation, talk to them like people, surprising what you like, how, you know, how easy you might find it to be. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause at first I was really, really afraid to talk to anybody. And then like seeing just how like a lot of artists and people carry themselves and, you know, the things that they're, con they have concerns and they have worries and they have their own things that they're, you know, have occupying their mind. And they're, I mean, again, they're just people. Like that's what that's what it really came down to. Like I would see them as such heroes, and they're like, they're, they're people. Like they're people who've done amazing things, but it doesn't change the fact that they still have human problems and you know concerns and and uh you know <laughs> and it's just like ha you know having a conversation is nice for anybody as long as it's not you know to try to gain something out of it or try to exploit somebody. And that's another thing that I wanted to talk about too. Um, I think that a lot of people can tend to get this wrong when they're trying to network and like, and you can usually tell them like from a mile away, like mm -hmm. when you're at an event or like when you are, um, you know, like hanging out with like, like for, like, for example, we would have launch parties, um, you know, for, for back when I worked at Floyd County, like when, you know, archery season, whatever would come out and like some, like inevitably there would be like a few people there who were just like there to like meet everybody and try to like, you know, like be like, how, how do I get in the industry? And they would come up to you and be like, oh, like, yeah, like here's my stuff. And like, and they would just like bombard you immediately with like, here's my pitch for myself. And I'm like, I'm here to unwind, <laughs> like talk to my friends. <laughs> like, it's cool that you have this, but I'm not here for this right now. And I think that um, they get over enthusiastic about making that pitch or really putting themselves out there. And they take it a little bit too literally so if you're if you're that kind of person don't feel bad just like maybe edit your approach and come at it a little bit more naturally where you are addressing a person not as a means to an end but just as an actual person that you would like to have a conversation with and it's not to be disingenuous about you your intent but it's just about to like you know kind of like even the level a little bit like they don't know who you are and if you come to a person saying hey i want this from you it usually doesn't really you know, leave a good taste in somebody's mouth. So maybe just try to make it a little bit more organic and authentic and, you know, be like, Hey, like I saw your work and I really like it. You know, just like, just talk to them. Um, you know, have a, have a normal conversation because yeah, I've had a lot of people who are just like, yeah, like this is my stuff. And like, I don't know if you have any openings right now. And I'm like, it's cool that you're shooting your shot, <laughs> but <laughs> It's like you're not here with anyone maybe make maybe make a friend like just make a friend Stop yeah a friend. yeah no it's it makes me think like uh, mark cuban on shark tank is like saying that everyone at every moment of every day is pitching to him and i'm like that must be so annoying and that's how it must feel for art directors and and like you were just saying you just want to unwind you just want to have a drink with your friends and here it's it's like now it's like you have to be on because this person needs something from you and mm -hmm. so i guess it's good to be hungry. It's good to be, you know, out there hustling, trying to get, you know, because we got bills to pay, you know, we all have careers that we want to make and stuff. But, but I think when you're at those events, it's always good to just kind of step outside of yourself for just a minute and, and put yourself in the shoes of the person you're trying to, to connect with, because yeah. at the end of the day, that's what you're trying to do is you're trying to connect with them. And again, I, I guess that's so not my personality. I don't, I, I would feel very embarrassed to do any of that stuff, but again, more power to you. That's your, if that's your skill set, that's your personality. I, I would just temper that a little bit by just trying to think like, I'm going to shoot my shot, but maybe like read a little bit of body language or whatever, you know, it's like, and, and I, I, the reason why I bring that up is because I think that's such a skill that it's, that yeah. a lot of artists don't have a lot of, you know, time to develop because we're always working by ourselves for the most part, you know, on something or concentrating on one thing, but 
you know, it took me years to really like study body language or study how people interact. And, and obviously my, my serving job helped me be a fly on the wall and watch how other people interact and, and, and forced me to be wallpaper to other people's conversations and, and talk about them and make the experience all about them. And that was really good training for that. But I think even before that, I loved people watching and, <laughs> um, and even just watching TV or movies and stuff and seeing how people interact. I, I was a really sheltered kid growing up. And so I would watch movies and TV shows and especially comedy because they, especially now comedies really like, like to poke fun at really bad, like social cues and, or just yeah. like, you know, it's super awkward and stuff. Um, and you know, TikTok and YouTube and things like that. There's lots of day in the life stuff that people like to post. So if you were super shy and super introverted and you don't have a lot of social interaction do your research and ever like, be creative about doing research about that stuff because it does it's not only good for for storytelling you know in terms of studying how people behave but it's also good for networking because I think a lot of times I've seen I've watched so many awkward situations where people like that have been so, trying so hard to sell and they're just not reading the other person's body language or their cues that they're giving off and we're all trying to be polite you know no one's going to tell you unless they're a real jerk, like, hey, stop, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, it's on, so it's on you to kind of realize when you should stop or when you should pull back, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think another, um, another thing that you could do is like maybe try to practice those social skills a little bit more in a lower stakes environment as well. Right. Um, and like, it's not that cons are high stakes, but it's like, you know, it might have a lot of people that you admire. Like that goes for anything like a gallery opening or, um, you know, like a big event. Um, like maybe like practice it at a smaller thing. Like, I don't know, like for example, the farmer's market, like maybe just like try to attempt to have a conversation with a vendor right. and like see what happens. That's a um, good idea. Yeah, cause like you don't, you don't know if it's like, it's low stakes. Like if, it, if you, if you bomb, like there's nothing writing on it. You're just like, oh, I had an awkward conversation. <laughs> I'm gonna leave now. <laughs> I guess I'm not buying, you know, honey or something. Or yeah, <laughs> yeah, maybe do it after you buy the thing. So you don't have to yeah. be bored right away from buying it. But that's one thing. I, I think some people are like even paralyzed about doing something like that though. Right. But I mean, but I think that it's really important because unfortunately this world is not designed for introverts yeah. and um, it's gotten a little bit better for, for us introverts because of social media and things like that. If we don't feel comfortable speaking something, we can at least type it out. And it's a little bit easier to, you know, edit and edit your sentences until you get it just right. But, um, you know, inevitably the face-to-face -face interaction is really nice to have too. And I think it, it's more memorable to be able to have a conversation with somebody face-to-face. -face. Um, and so I think it's good. It's a good skill to practice and it's a good skill to have um, to understand like, you know, how do I talk? about you know stuff with a person or how do I you know discuss this or where can you find the common ground with that person and you know glom onto that because usually nine times out of ten if you're at a convention somebody's gonna have something in common with you that's just a, you know the way of the con um, you're all here for the same reason at least one of the same reasons yeah. so if you can find a common ground and just like make a friend that that approach is probably going to work way better than you pitching yourself to them because having a friend is like some, that's something that like sticks. That's something that, you know, like you won't have to ask somebody to do a thing for you because they're like, this is my friend. I want to help them. Yeah. And like, that's, I mean, that's honestly how I've gotten, you know, around in my career is just because I, I have friends like, and just naturally, and they're the ones who are like, Hey, like, I think that you would be good for this position. You should apply. Um, and, you know, I would still go and do it myself, but they were the ones who told me about those opportunities. If I didn't make friends, if I didn't have that, you know, network of people who I knew, you know, I probably wouldn't be here right now. Like, actually, I definitely wouldn't be here right now. I wouldn't have heard about this job. So, you know, making friends is really, really important. And like, you know, trying, trying to interact with somebody as a person, first and foremost, rather than as a networking opportunity, I think is, is much more important. Um, I think one of my first experiences with somebody who I like really, really admired, um, it was uh, Dan Dos Santos at Dragon Con. And like one of my friends knew him and you know, they're like, oh, like, yeah, Dan, like I'm just gonna go over and talk to him. And like, I was just like watching from the distance, just like, that's Dan, like you just can't talk to him, that's crazy. And my friend walked away and I was like, well, maybe I can talk to him if he's like, you know, he knows my friend and like, and I just like came over, like sidled over to him and I'm like, hey, it's great work. I know Ricardo. And, and he's like, oh, that's cool. And like, we just started to have a conversation. And, and then, you know, like Dan's my friend now. And I'm like, that's awesome. <laughs> like every year I would see him at Dragon Con, we would hang out, uh, you know, like, you know, go, you know, with my, my friends and everything, get drinks and just like talk about art. 
and it was just a really nice experience. Like having those experiences are, are definitely worth it. And again, like even if you're an introvert, even if you're a little shy about talking to people, I guarantee you, like you probably know how to talk a little bit about that thing you love. Yeah. So if you find someone else who loves that thing you love, you're probably, you'll, you can probably be okay. You'll probably be all right. <laughs> Definitely. And I, I love what you said earlier too, that remember that your heroes are people, because I don't think there's any person that wa- that wants to be treated like not a person, you know, even, even just yeah. gushing and fangirling, fanboying, all that kind of stuff. That's so, that's kind of like dehumanizing that person to some level, you know, it's like, especially if you're doing it face to face, it's kind of awkward, you know? And so I feel like the people who kind of stand out because most people tend to react to them in that way, the people sort of stand out and who they might want to interact with are people who treat them like just a real person and, and, and seem genuinely interested in them and not just their work or not just, you know, the, the amazing thing they do. Um, And so, and that's such a, like a tricky balance. I think sometimes like I I have avoided meeting some of my heroes for a few years. If I know they're going to be there in another year, because I'm trying to like, work my confidence up to meeting them, you know, and I don't want to blow my first impression and stuff like that. And, and that's okay too. Like, you don't have to rush in there and just like, this is your only chance. Like it is a small world and we'll probably, you know, see each other again. And so if you're not feeling confident and you don't know how to approach somebody, don't force the moment, you know, just, yeah. just try to be as natural as you can and try to, you know, it's like, it's, it's okay to wait is what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, like, yeah, like when you, when you see people only as like that person on a pedestal, like they, I mean, like you were saying, it is dehumanizing. They can definitely tell that you're like, it's, it feels like you're not really seeing the person for who they are because you think you're, you already have established this image of them in your head and you're projecting this image onto them pretty actively and forcibly. Mm-hmm. And, I, you know, and certain aspects, everybody kind of does this a little bit, yeah. but if you like, you know, if you can't stop the flow of the gushing, then it becomes really awkward because I'm just, they're like, I mean, how do you react to that? Like, how do you react to somebody coming to you, Mia, for example, and saying, oh my God, Mia, your work, your work is so amazing. I've been following you for years. Like, and they just like keep saying like, I just think you're, you're so cool. And like your work is like, you you know, the colors and the themes and everything. Like, I just want to be like you. And like, it just keeps happening and, and doesn't stop. And like, they don't really take the time to like, slow down and ask you a question like oh like what's your process or like how did you land on these themes like they're just like saying things at you Mm -hmm. and like that's when it feels a little bit like because you can't respond to that there's nothing to really say back to it but thank you (laughs) thank you and thank you and thank you (laughs) you made somebody else feel awkward yeah and And there's nothing wrong with saying that to the person you like again it's like it's such a fine line and it's like you don't you don't know until you've crossed that line sometimes you know (laughs) when it's too much (laughs) yeah and like a part of reading body language too is like seeing like when the person is like trying to turn away or like service other customers and you're still trying to like just like maybe like if you see a person like tr- trying to turn their attention off of you, like maybe like just let them breathe a second, like <laughs> look yeah. at their stuff. Like they have their things on the table for you to look at. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, if you're worried about your social skills or if you're a little bit socially awkward, which a lot of us are, it's okay. Mm-hmm. Then, um, you know, maybe you just give them some time to collect themselves and, you know, for- maybe you formulate some questions that you want to ask them that have a depth that's more than a yes or no answer <laughs> because yeah. it's like, you know, I like it when people ask me like, oh, like, what's your process? Or like, how did you come up with this idea? Like, cause that, that's like, I can really like dig deep and like start to talk about my work and like, oh, this person is actually really interested in like what I'm creating and what I have to say. And that feels really good because that means they've thought about, you know, what they want to, to ask of you. And I kind of like that. Yeah. It's, it's better than just like the standard, like, oh, your work is so pretty. And I'm like, I like that compliment. It's a really nice compliment. But when people really try to like, you know, understand like where I'm coming from, it, it helps like, it helps make that connection a little bit more um, genuine because I'm like, oh, like that's something that like, you know, this is something that I put a lot of work into obviously. And they want me to share that with them in a, in a better way to really understand where I come from. And that's really, that's a, that's a big compliment. So um, I think that's a good way to start a conversation. Definitely. So, yeah. Or even just actually, I've had people that will be like, oh my God, your work is so amazing. It reminds me of this that I grew up, or I grew up with this, for instance, mm-hmm. like Alice in Wonderland is one of my favorite books. And then that's like, oh, it's my favorite book too. And then we start talking about that. So um, sometimes I guess if you want to stand out from uh, the hundred people that told this person uh, that it's amazing, why is it amazing to you? What does it mean to you? Like, we love hearing that as well, you know, yeah. at, at a convention and stuff like that. But the other thing I wanted to say was uh, what I was saying about like, maybe waiting if you don't feel like you're in the moment to, to do this right. I guess the way, what I was trying to say is uh, 
if, if you feel like if you don't get the reaction you want, which again is a 50, 50 chance on some level from this particular person, cause they mean that much to you. If you're, if you know, you're going to take the bad reaction badly, then don't do it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it should be a selfless act. It should be, I want to say this to this person, regardless of how they react to me. That's at least how I conduct myself because otherwise, again, there's so many factors. This person can be exhausted. They might've just yeah. had a delayed flight and landed right now and drag themselves to the floor and they can't give you the reaction you want that you've been waiting all this time. So sometimes we put all our emotions out there and expect it to be received in the exact same way that we put it out there. And if that's how you feel about any interaction, I would just hold back until you are a little bit more, more like balanced about it um, because it is a 50 50 chance that you're going to get the reaction you want, you know? And, yeah. and again, if you get a bad reaction, like there's always like, if your hero turns out to be a jerk or whatever, unless it happens repeatedly, I like to think that the first time that happens, that was not about me. It's about that person, you know, what they're going through right now. And I can't read their mind and all that kind of stuff. So definitely take that with a grain of salt as well. Um, and, and again, try to put yourself in other people's shoes at these events. There's so much chaos, so much stress, so many emotions going on. And especially for art directors, for people that you know, are recruiters who are offering jobs, they probably look at all of us like zombies, like trying to like, <laughs> trying to like rip limbs off of them, you know, because and they don't have a lot of jobs to offer, you know, so it's like, if they're being more guarded, or they're not giving you the response that you want, there's a reason for that. And that's, and it has nothing to do with your worth or your value as a person. So, yeah. Yeah. And like, and another way to think of that too, is like, you know, because they're seeing hundreds or thousands of people a day, it's like, you were just one face in the crowd, really. And so in a, in a kind of a way, the stakes are a little bit lower because they may not remember you and that's okay. <laughs> and so even if you feel like you've bombed it, like they're probably not going to remember like you, like, I can't remember distinctly, like a single like conversation that's like happened um that like you know was particularly awful like or who was the perpetrator of that awful conversation because like there was just so many people that flowed through throughout the day that you know like you're focused on selling your work um you know and there's some faces i remember of like recurring customers or people who were really unique but for the most part like i'm not like going home thinking like wow that person was like the worst because <laughs> i was just like oh that was such a good day or that man that was such a bad day for sales um, you know, like I only remember if people are actively being creepy or if people um, are being like, you know, super like so nice that they're like offering to get me things or like, hey, like you, you need food or something like that. Like that's always really sweet of people yeah. to do. But, um, you know, I usually don't remember most of those in between interactions just because they're so those experiences are, tra are so transient that, you know, they just kind of come and go. And so if you kind of think of it like that, that you're not going to be you know, like maybe you're probably not going to be the worst part of somebody's day. <laughs> and it'd be nice to be the best part of somebody's day, but that's probably not going to happen either. Let's be real. And, and that's okay because that takes a lot of the pressure off of you feeling like you have to perform because it's just, you know, the stakes aren't super high where you're like, everything is riding on this. Like, no, there's thousands of artists to talk to and you're, you're one of many people. It is okay. Like you can, you can chill. And if you want to stand out from the crowd, you can work up to that. But for now, just like have conversations, you know, or like maybe just like say a comment and like let people respond to it. And then, you know, you can move on however you want to deal with it. Take it at your own pace and don't try to force yourself to go from, you know, I talked to one person and now I'm like, you know, I'm talking to everybody or I'm presenting to everybody because that's probably not going to happen. Don't try to force it. Yeah. Is what I'm saying. And don't get offended if they don't remember your name. Like I've heard, I've heard, been on those like panels before or workshops where somebody be like, hey, I met you at this con. Do you remember me? don't put them on the spot like that. You know, don't like, do that. That don't is, do that. I mean, like seriously having serving a serving job and going to conventions at the same time, I literally must've seen hundreds, thousands of people and had, and exchange names. Cause I would do this thing where I'd be like, what's your name? And, and ask their name in the moment. So I could say their name and say, thank you, because that's something that means something to me that I yeah. also cannot possibly remember. Like I remember a face because I'm a visual person and I love faces and, and, and that kind of thing. But it, I'll be like, you look familiar, but I don't remember your name and I don't remember where I met you. Please help that person out. And don't be offended because it's, it's, a, it's a hard job to when, you when you're on a people facing or public facing kind of job, it's a lot of pressure to remember people's names, especially a year after the fact, two years, like don't do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely don't do that. I've definitely had people do that to me and I'm like, oh man, like, cause it yeah. just makes them feel bad. <laughs> I feel like, so bad when I don't remember people. <laughs> yeah, you're like, I care about you, but I don't, I, I, I don't have the bandwidth. I don't, I'm not a computer, you know, like. 
<laughs> I don't know who I am. <laughs> really bad. And I'm like, I'm actually notorious bad at notoriously bad at recognizing faces. Um, and so I often have to like look at an object that they're wearing or if there's something like unique, like I'll have to remember them by that because I see so many different faces and I, like my ADD doesn't let me like really key in on it and like commit it to memory because I have a trash short term memory. Mm. So I have to really um, work hard to remember. And so I, I feel doubly bad when people come back to my table, even like the day after and they're like, hey, I came to your table. Do you remember me? And I'm like, oh like yeah i do like that's a lie to them don't make don't make somebody lie to you <laughs> don't do that to them <laughs> and and i'm like oh yeah catch them out the lie either that's rude that's just like i've had people be like kind of like try to quiz me and i'm like no don't do that that's not cool like that's not cool and it's not gonna leave a good taste in my mouth it's gonna make me feel like wow that person's trying to make me look an asshole and it's like I don't think this is a genuine interaction. You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so many ways to just like have it like be gentle, authentic, and mm. let it go well. So I think you know, first and foremost, if you're visiting somebody's table, I think starting with a compliment is a really good thing to do. Like I like you know what I said earlier was just like gushing, like over over gushing. But saying you know I really love your work, that's always a really o good opener. A better way to make yourself memorable is to say something that you like about their work. What is it about their work that you like? Like, hey, I really like the way you use color, or I like your themes, or I like your characters or your figures. Like, that's just a little bit, that gives somebody a little bit more, um, you know, and then find, like, if you want to have a conversation with somebody, what I call it is finding a conversation that has an open door and not a dead end, um, because there's a lot of conversations that are like, you know, you start to say something or you say something and they, you know, you can only respond with a yes or no answer. Find a question that does not just have a yes or no answer and actually leads into something a little deeper. Mm -hmm. For example, like, wow, I really like the way you do you, your, your covers or whatever. And they're like, oh, thank you. And it's just like the way to continue that conversation is like, I've actually been struggling with covers. Like, how do you work through X, Y, and Z process? And like, they can answer that question and like, you know, lead into like, um, whatever you're struggling with or like whatever they like however they get through their struggles but like either way like something that actually has a lead in to more comments a dialogue is generally what you would want if you want to have a conversation with somebody um you know especially somebody you admire because it gets it's really intimidating mm -hmm. um and it's easy to just like have that yes or no answer and then you're like okay bye because <laughs> i've definitely done that many times before yeah. and i'm just like always disappointed after i leave because i'm like i should have done more i should have like had a better question to ask them um yeah and like you know tr try to leave a, behind your business card or something like that it's like hey like you know i'm trying to do you know blah 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 or like hey like this is just my card if you're interested in this um you know if you have something to exchange with them and you know usually they'll give you uh theirs i, I, I collect tons of business cards over the course of a convention it's not rare um and usually I look at them afterwards too, just to be like, who do I talk to? And it's like a nice way to kind of go through your memories and be like, oh yeah, that person, I remember them. Um, and so like having a nice, like memorable card, if you, if you want to give your information to people is uh, a good thing. But, um, you know, it's like, it's also a good way to just be like, you know, hi, I have friends. Like, you know, I've, I've found people who I can talk to about X, Y, and Z topic, and you can see them year over year and get closer to them in a way that like, you know, like sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. But yeah, like there's different ways of going about it. And again, just take it at your own pace and do what, you know, is comfortable for you uh, in the moment and don't try to force yourself to do more than you're ready for. Cause that's how you can end up spiraling really quickly. And that's not fun. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's ways to do that. And I have friends too, that are very like nervous. Like, like one fr good friend of mine said that she's too nervous to like call somebody like a store on the phone and she needs to write a script for herself. Otherwise she'll get too nervous. Um, and as somebody that had to answer a lot of phone calls, like as a host, you know, or at a retail shop, I can tell you that the, the quicker into the point that you are on the other side of that line, you know, the mm -hmm. more I won't remember you in a bad way, you know, but it's yeah, just it's like, honestly, again, and on that, on that end of things, we're not remembering how you sound or how awkward or unsure, as long as I answer the question, got to keep going, that's all that matters. And it sort of also applies to this convention situation. It, it doesn't matter if you're kind of awkward as long as you kind of got to the point like pretty succinctly or pretty quick, quickly and it'll take time to do that like trial mm. and error right um but yeah again i don't think people remember the nuances of oh they their hands looked sweaty or, or, <laughs> or whatever <laughs> or they stuttered when they said that like no one will care as long as you got to the point and they had a thing they're like oh that person gave me some nice feedback you know 
that'll mm -hmm. be the takeaway from that interaction not not all the nuance so exactly this is like again like you're not you're probably not going to be the most remarkable part of anybody's day yeah <laughs> that takes a lot of pressure off yeah it's liberating <laughs> it's isn't it it's 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 less stressful that way. It's not about you. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It makes things way easier when you realize things are not about you. And it's like, oh, like that's, yeah, it's a good way to kind of like to really start to be yourself a little bit more and start to really feel comfortable in your own skin, knowing that everything is not about you, because that means all eyes are not on you and everybody's not expecting something of you. Like yeah. when somebody comes up to my table, I don't have any expectations of them aside from are they probably, are they here to look at my art? I hope they're here to buy something. And like, you know, if we have a conversation from that, it's like, oh, cool. Like we're having a conversation. This is cool. But I wasn't expecting anything of that person aside from, are you here to look at my art or buy my art? It's, it's fine. Okay. They're gone. Bye. It's like, that's all. That's, that's the whole interaction usually. So, you know, the fact that you're even putting yourself out there is already like, you know, you're putting yourself in a different, slightly different category than the normal, but then you're in like still a category with many other people and it's okay. Yeah. You're not, you're not going to stand out in a crazy way. I promise you'll, you'll be all right. No one will notice that you fidgeted. <laughs> Do you want to talk a little bit about portfolio reviews? Like, isn't that kind of a part of networking as well in terms Very of how so. you come across? Like you've done a lot of them, right? Like, and, and what are some things that you, some do's and don'ts just in general that you would suggest like what not to do when you're asking someone from, for feedback that you're hoping will hire you or <laughs> what do you do, you know? <laughs> oh man, this is a good question. Um, I haven't, man, actually I've been doing portfolio reviews, especially at Lightbox. Um, that was a really, Lightbox was a really good uh, example of like, of like many different experiences that I had. I think that uh, if somebody is taking the time to look at your portfolio and give you feedback, don't refute their feedback as soon as they give it to you. <laughs> don't tell them why they're wrong. They're, they're a professional and maybe they are wrong. Who cares? But you have to kind of let that go a little bit because when you are trying to correct somebody and be like, oh, like, actually, like, I don't think this is right because of this. And it, sometimes it can come off as kind of cocky. And also, uh, you don't seem like you have awareness around uh, your work or like you haven't noticed the error that is in your work. And you're like trying to excuse it away rather than really look at it critically and address it. Um, I've seen a lot of people get kind of defensive uh, about critique because they weren't really ready for it. So first and foremost, please make sure that you are ready to deal with a critique. Like you were saying, Mia, if you are not in the headspace to deal with an artist with, you know, maybe a, a bad attitude or kind of grumpy or a bad portfolio review, then maybe wait until you're in a better headspace because you don't want to come off as aggressive, ungrateful, or defensive. Um, and I've seen people do that before. And with my portfolio reviews, I try to be as professional and constructive as possible but sometimes they can be harsh because i'm just like i want to give you all the things that you you need to know that you should work on um and it's it's all to help you be better usually when people are spending time giving portfolio reviews and maybe you know may, at least 90 percent of the people who are doing it maybe some people are power tripping but most of the people who are there are really trying to you know give you feedback to help you improve so that you can come back with a stronger portfolio later and so they're not there to, um, you know, to be an, an enemy. And I've been on the other side of this where I definitely felt like I had been attacked before. Like <laughs> when I'm like, oh my God, he hates my work so much. And I left all my stuff behind because I was so dazed after that awful portfolio review. But I didn't like project any of that to him. I was just like, okay, thank you. <laughs> but like, it was still nerve wracking to be able to get that feedback. But take that feedback to heart too and like look at your work critically and see like maybe you know maybe all of their points aren't you know what you want to take take everything with a grain of salt but maybe one or two of those things do matter and maybe you should take that to heart and look at your own work but a self-aware artist is a really good thing to see for me uh somebody who's like oh yeah like i like when when you comment on something and they say, oh yeah, like I, you know, I think that you're right. Like I'll, that I could have done better on that or could have colored that differently. Being self-aware and like reflective about yourself is usually a good sign that, that tells me that you are thinking of how to grow and improve. Um, and so I do like to see that in portfolio reviews. Um, and also what I will say uh, to that point, don't put your work down oh, before yeah. anybody's gotten a chance to see it. Yeah. Let them form their own opinions about what your work is. Because if you say, oh, this isn't my best, first off, why is it in your portfolio if it isn't your best? Second off, you're, you're telling them how to feel about your work. Yeah. So 
you don't want to color that opinion. You want them to develop that for you. And maybe after they've commented on something that you know you need to fix, you're like, you can then say probably like, oh yeah, like I think I could have done better there. And I think that's fine, but don't preface it with, I don't think this is that good because they're automatically gonna start. It's like, okay, I'm probably looking at something lackluster then. <laughs> don't disclaim your own work, please. Don't do that. <laughs> And that's almost like putting emotional baggage out there for them to address, which is not the responsibility. You know, it's like, you should, you should be confident about putting yourself forward, but also have the humility to know that you don't have all the answers and you're coming to them for wisdom. That's literally what you're there for. Even if they're bad at their giving feedback, you got more information than you had before and you can choose what to do with it. But yeah, I I totally agree with everything you said. And I, it made me think how much, uh, how many of these competition shows like face off and project runway that I've watched over the years. Yes. (laughs) And it's really helped to see how like the jerks kind of like, you know, respond to feedback where they're super cocky and stuff. And there's like these like world-class designers and stuff. And you're just like cringing for them. And and I think to me, it's just like, I don't want to be that person, you know? And so yeah. again, sometimes learn by watching other people do it badly is, is helpful. Um, but yeah, always, I think always just be really grateful for the opportunity. And, um, but yeah, you don't have to do it all yourself. And um, and it's hard. It's hard to learn how to how to deal with interact with people. And I think part of it's disheartening that you you maybe thought, hey, this is a career that I don't have to have people skills for. And I hate to regret. Like I regret to inform you that unless we've said this before, unless you're like Kim Jong Gi, yeah. he still had to hire people that work with him, and he still has to be enjoyable enough to work with for those people. So he still had to have people skills to have people handling his people skills for him. So yeah. it's, it's a skill set. That's, that's the important thing that like it can be learned. Mm-hmm. Um, and for some people it might take longer than for others. And don't beat yourself up if it takes you longer to learn. It's go at your own pace. Don't compare yourself to anybody else. So. Yeah. It's, it, and it's really easy to like, unfortunately, compare yourself to other people. And like, you look at them and like, how are they so effortless at it? If you see somebody who's like really good at communicating and you, like, especially if you know them, maybe ask them, ask them how they communicate or what their approach is. Cause like, I am an introvert who's been adopted and who's been adopted by several extroverts and they all have such a unique approach to uh, talking to people and they like open people up so easily and they're effortless and fluid. And I'm like, oh, how are they doing that? And I'm like, oh, I can just ask them. They're my friend. And I say, hey, like, how do you like open people up like that? Like, I don't understand. And they just say like, oh, like you just, you know, treat them like a person. And, and they say that, you know, for them, it's like so simple. So I have to kind of dig in them to get a little bit more. But again, like, you know, we do have uh, this idea that we have to do everything alone and that like, oh my God, we're so much stronger for having done everything alone. Or like, you just don't think about the fact that you can use the, you know, resources that you have. You can ask your friends questions. You can ask people you admire questions and you can ask about different approaches to things. You don't have to just like try to figure everything out by yourself. Yeah. because it's it's going to take you so much longer to do that when the answers might be right there and you just don't know it yet so um you know it's definitely a really good approach to just be a little bit more curious about you know people and how they function and how they do things that are amazing um even if you can't replicate it it's nice to know one approach to it because everybody's going to have a different approach but one of definitely one of the most fascinating things uh for me has been observing extroverts in their natural habitat yeah and then and then grilling them about it later. (laughs) And also like people, like, again, people like to talk about themselves. So they probably get happy when you like ask them, how do you do that? Like, how do you light up a room? And yeah. And it's really good advice to get from, you know, somebody who has the ability to do so. So, you know, try not to be, try not to be as afraid. I know it's hard and I can't just say, don't be afraid because that's not feasible, but try to practice what you can and try to understand and learn what you can and develop that over time. There's, there have been people who are still very introverted who I talk to and have had conversations with and, you know, they, they struggle, they, they fought through those barriers and they, yeah, they might've been a little bit awkward, but I admired the fact that they were putting themselves out there anyway, because it's, despite their awkwardness, they still managed to have a dialogue with me and, Mm -hmm. you know, at conventions, like I kind of expected because a lot of people are awkward there, but the fact that people even made the effort, I think that's really cool. And I think that, you know, it's not going to come off as a bad thing unless you're like, you know, like also just make sure you're not creeping on somebody like don't do that but it's usually not a bad thing to have a conversation about things that you both have something in common with so yeah it's okay yeah and honestly as a as an introvert I used to hate it when people would like I I feel like especially in this culture people glorify people who are loud people who are very like Mm -hmm. overly dramatic or very attention seeking and I'm just not that way and I, I used to think that I had to be like that 
and you don't that's the thing it's like just be who you are and and honestly it's like even if it's not as as popular in in the, in the culture that you live in like just being how you are it's I think being genuine is so much more important and being true to yourself is so much more important like people can see through an act if you're trying to put on a facade or put on an act and it's just it's never good so um I, I honestly find different kinds of people interesting I think if everybody was exactly the same that would be really obnoxious and so just lean into your strengths like that that's what makes you special is that you're you're different and um yeah. even if you think it makes you awkward it's like to somebody else it's going to make you interesting and memorable so um and same with actually to our uh English as a second language friends I'm, I don't even know if I'm saying that right if English isn't your first language and you're kind of self-conscious of your accent I have a lot of friends that that feel this way I love accents I think that they're awesome and and they make you memorable as well if we're just still on this topic and and I just feel like the, the assholes who would judge you for that are not people you want to know anyway exactly. so just be proud and just lean into it yeah absolutely and if you don't feel comfortable about your speaking skills yet like with other people then again it's something that you might want to practice with a friend or just like make sure that your dialogue is coming off the way you're intending it to be because I know um you know just from talking to other people uh, that are ESL like I you know like they feel like they're like oh like I'm sorry my English is really bad and I'm like your English is actually really good like usually it's really good um, like, and and you know it's like even if it's not like there yet it's something that you can definitely like bounce off of somebody practice um, and you know like if you have an English speaking friend um, who can like correct your own grammar or like kind of like lead you through it so that you can slowly like get you know kind of like the point that you want to get across um, you know and if you don't feel super confident then maybe having you know kinds of things that you you know to say or that you want to say um you at least have your your few lines that you're comfortable with that's a good place to start and then you can expand out from there yeah. um i know because I'm, I'm actually currently working with uh a few people um who has english as their second language and one of them is actively trying to improve the grammar and how how she's doing it is looking at other people's emails and how they write things and how they say things and i think that's a really cool approach so i'm like oh yeah like you're just learning by like you know, kind of like repeating those things that you're like, okay, like maybe I should phrase it like this instead. And um, I think if you can get somebody to help you through that, that should be fine as well. But yeah, if anybody's being a jerk because of your accent, like don't, you don't, that's not, that's not a cool person. Don't let them, <laughs> don't let them get to you. I'm sorry. That's info you have about them. So exactly, <laughs> I, would not, I would not see it as, you know, and he's a stumbling block for you. It's do you keep doing you, you know? That's their, that's their, that's their problem for sure. Yeah. Oh, damn. Like that was another thing I wanted to talk about was like messaging people and oh. uh, like, as an introvert, because I'm like, maybe if you can't talk to them, you can message them later after, you know, the show and like, be like, Hey, like I saw you, I got to talk to you briefly. Um, but like, you know, I just wanted to say like, thank you for giving me some of your time. Um, and like, yeah, like just like, you know, you can do that sometimes like you know, they might not always respond, but when they do, maybe that can open up a conversation as well. Some people do that to me. Yeah. when I um like after I leave the convention and I'm like you know oh that's so nice like I, I usually put it in my starred folder like my uh gmail to make sure I follow up on it later oh, and like cool. yeah but it's just like a nice like a little like you know glimmer even if it's just a thank you message like that's really cool and the power of the follow-up is super important even if you're an introvert yeah and you felt like you didn't get to say it in person say it in the email you know and it's like it, it's it comes off more removed as well so you don't sound like you're gushing or you're, you're putting too much out there but it's, it's super powerful as a, almost like a lead behind, you know? Yeah, like follow-up is really important because I, I always, rem it guarantees that I'm going to remember that person even more now. Yeah. And, um, you know, like something thoughtful, but like, as long as you're not badger, like, please do not badger the person if they haven't responded to you. Don't, don't do that. Mm -hmm. You send that one message, you leave it there. If they respond to you, then you can continue to message, but do not like continuously send messages like, hey, did you get my message? Did you like, because like, that's not, <laughs> oh my God, do not do that. Yeah, I cannot stress enough how bad that is to do because they will block you and they will be like, hey, like, cut it out because they're not, they, they're, they're not entitled to, or sorry, you're not entitled to their time. Yeah. They're not obligated to give you anything like that follow up message is genuinely to tell them that you appreciated their experience. If they want to respond to you, that, that is up to them and the ball's in their court. So be careful about that. Do not do that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, follow up messages are really nice. I, I like getting them. And that, in fact, use the follow-up message to, to kind of give them agency. So just like, if you yes. want to keep in touch, say, would it be okay if I kept in touch with you from time mm -hmm. to time on my current projects? Like give them the right to say yes or no. And that yeah. way, if they do say yes, then you're like, yes, it's hundred percent clear that I can follow up with this person. But uh, instead of an ask, instead of, can we meet next week? Or can we set a meeting? 
you know, just, just say, would it be okay if we kept in touch or something like that? Like that, that's at least how I would recommend doing it. Always, yeah. always try to err on the side of giving them like the power to say yes or no and to set their boundaries. So. Yeah. I wholeheartedly agree with that. That's a really good point. So I do have one last thing I, I'd want to say. Um, I think, uh, I think it's really important to establish your boundaries, especially as a young artist. Um, unfortunately the art world, there's a lot of, there's a lot of grifters out there. There's a lot of creeps out there. There's a lot of people that that prey on artists. And I don't want to say that to make you scared, but it's just a reality. And especially at these big events, it's kind of hard to tell people apart. A lot of them are really good at what they do and they come off as really nice, really genuine, or actually really connected. And so I would take everything everybody tells you with a grain of salt. And uh, and and that's another great thing about a network is cross like cross checking with the people you know about this person. And I see that a lot in some of the discords that I'm in where people sort of go, like take a beat and say, is this too good to be true? Is this person reliable and trustworthy? And that's always good to do. Um, and, and definitely protect your boundaries in, in every case. Uh, I think especially women and, and femmes are, you know, like encouraged to be, to be nice and to not be a jerk or not be a bitch, you know, and that sort of thing. And, and I say that, uh, you know, niceness can honestly go by the wayside if it means protecting your boundaries. And that's the first and foremost. And, and it is really easy, especially online with how accessible people are you seem you feel like you know someone more than you actually do and it's very easy to cross boundaries and so i think it's just it's always okay to establish those boundaries and to take a step back if you if you're not feeling comfortable in any situation so anyway I'm yeah it's worth being said and from experience too like you know not like in the moment sometimes it can be really hard to uphold those boundaries because like if you don't feel safe if you feel threatened uh, people can often have a fear response of freezing or like fawning yeah. so that you're trying to placate somebody and um, you know like having having a buddy that you're going with you know like with to these events can be a really good thing because then you have somebody who is like a safe marker for you but if you have to go alone then like try to like you know if you feel like you're unsafe like at least like try to excuse yourself politely exit the conversation and maybe you know find a way to to drift away from that person who's making you feel very uncomfortable um, because some people feel trapped and, you know, try to, you know, get a way out if you can, uh, so that you don't have to feel like you're stuck in that situation. Um, and you don't have to be, you know, I know people are afraid of being rude because afraid of being, you know, retaliation and everything. So, um, if you can just like, you know, just make an excuse, like, Hey, I have to go to the bathroom or, Hey, I have to check on something. Um, you know, you can just like politely exit from that situation if you can. But, um, but yeah, you do have to like watch out sometimes because there are some people who are looking to take advantage um, and they often do hide. Um, I was just working with somebody who was like that. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I didn't know for, you know, for knowing that person for a while. And sometimes you just don't know who is who. Yeah. And so, um, you know, like try to read as, ma as many signs as you can, or like try to just like, you know, protect yourself in, in any way you can. It's really, really important. But, you know, also we want to make this environment safe for everybody to be able to participate in, to participate in and it's totally on those creeps who are making it unsafe and so we want to try to cut that out where it's possible so yeah just as a warning not to scare anybody again um but just to say you know be careful as you go along with networking with people and um you know don't take advantage of anybody don't let anybody take advantage of you if you can and uh you know just try to get out there and be safe yeah that's really it so, all right. Well, I think that's a good place to end it. So uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. I hope this was helpful for whoever's watching. And if there's anything else that you want uh, us to discuss on the show, then please uh, feel free to join our Facebook group, uh, the Painted in Color Discussion Group on Facebook. Um, you can request to join and uh, we will accept it most likely. Uh, but it's a good place to discuss the topics that we've talked about on these episodes and uh, future discussion topics you could vote on as well. So hopefully we'll see you there. We'll see you next time. Bye everybody. <laughs>